Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss fair value accounting and specifically the hierarchy level in determining fair value accounting level 1, level 2, and level 3. Fair value accounting has gained significant importance in the recent years. But what is fair value? Just what are we talking about here? Fair value is when you determine the actual current worth of an asset or for that matter of a liability. So you're looking to see how much an asset is worth. Also how much a liability is worth in an orderly transaction. Orderly means what? Orderly means between two independent buyer and sellers with no undue pressure, independent market participant. People who are willing and have benefit, mutual benefit in making the trade. How much is something is worth in a trade like this? This is what fair value is. In fair value, it allows the company to move from reporting assets and liabilities at historical cost. So it's moving away from historical cost. Then if you're moving away from historical costs, you are reporting your assets and liabilities at current fair market value. And I want you to think of this as the two extreme. What are the two extreme? On one side, we have cost reporting things at, it, at its historical cost. And the other extreme is reporting things at fair value. Historically, well, we looked at historically at historical cost. When we buy an asset, when we acquire a liability, it's recorded at cost. What's happening now is let's report those assets and liabilities at how much they are worth today. Now, how do we determine how much they are worth today? This is what we will discuss in this session. How do we come up with this fair value, fair value accounting? So those are the two extremes. There are many methods in between, but the two extremes are cost and fair value. So we will explore the different valuation method. Valuation means what? How do we come up with this number and understand this hierarchy level, level one, level two, level three, and how to measure fair value. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Historical cost. We discussed that one, one extreme is historical cost because traditionally, historically, historical cost is what we used. Why did we use historical cost? If you, when you took your financial accounting, that's the first principle you learn. When you purchase something, it's based on historical cost. Why? Because the number is objective and it's verifiable. That's why. It's we can see how much exactly we paid. We can verify it. It's objective. However, as the demand for more accurate valuation, more recent, more relevant valuation is required, well, what we did is we tried to look at something else and at an alternative, and that's fair value. So as I mentioned earlier on the earlier slide, cost, historical cost, and fair value are the two extremes. Let's talk a little bit about history of fair value because it's not easy to determine fair value. Prior to 2006, we had no guidelines for determining fair value. So before 2006, this lesson did not exist because there was no guidance. We did not have any specific rules in determining how do we determine the fair value of something. And that led to inconsistencies among companies, led to a lot of estimates, subjective measurement, because we did not have standardized method. So this lack of standardization raised concern about potential abuses. The, the most famous case is Enron. However, both IFRS and GAAP agreed on specific rules. So th this is good because this is there's a compliance between the International Financial Reporting Standard and US GAAP on how do we determine fair value. So defining fair value, we define fair value as an exit price. Well, what is exit price? It represents the amount at which to be received by selling an asset or transfer a liability. Remember, we are valuing assets and liability in an orderly transaction between two independent market participants. Again, we're back to this idea of we have 
buyers and sellers who are, in quote, adult, reasonable, aware of what they are doing, and they are exchanging an asset at an exit price. Now, it's essential to note that orderly transaction refer to non-liquidating scenarios. It's not where you're trying to liquidate, get out, where assets are not sold hastily due to a fire sale. You are not selling your asset in a forced sale. You're just performing, you are carrying this transaction in a normal day-to-day -day activity. So the valuation should be carried out with the assumption of independent market participants who are not related to the entity or individual in any fraudulent activity. Once again, back to that independent participant. It's an exit price. That's what we are talking about here. And we have to discuss what is we have a principal market. So it's very important that these individuals are conducting this transaction and there's a principal market for this transaction. What is a principal market? So we need to define this market. Principal market is the market with the most volume and activity for the asset or the liability in question. It's the first place entities look when determine fair value. So principal market is where the most bananas, let's assume these are bananas, are sold. In which market the most bananas, assuming we're discussing bananas, uh, bananas are sold. This is how every entity can access. Also, we, not only there is a market, also if we are determining the fair value, do we have access to that market? It means we can buy and sell on this market. If, the, if, if there's a market and we have no access to this market, it's not relevant for us. Okay. So if the entity can, can access the principal market, the price in that market is the fair value regardless of any price of any other market. Because the assumption is because it has the largest volume, it should have the fairest price. And if you have access to it, you can value your asset based on that. Case in point, stocks. Stocks and bonds. If the stock and the bond is traded on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, Guess what? This is the principal market. Yeah, it could be traded also on some other small exchange, but we would look at the price at the NYSE and the NASDAQ. Usually shouldn't be no di difference between the stock prices between different market, just in case. Also, we need to know of the what we need to know about the principal market. If the asset or the liability are traded in the principal market, we don't take into account transaction costs. And this is important. I would work a simulation or an exercise in the next session showing you the transaction cost. Well, what happens if we don't have a principal market? Simply put, we don't have a market where it represents the most volume or the most activity for the asset or the liability. Well, we would look at the most advantageous market. So what is advantageous market? So what is that? No, notice what I showed you. I showed you here like two stores. In a principal market, you could have like maybe 50 stores. Here I'm trying to show there's only one store. So it's like the market is smaller. If the principal market is not accessible or it does not exist, then the entity would look at the most advantageous market. So what is the most advantageous market? This is the market that maximizes the amount that would be received for the asset or minimize the amount that would be paid for the liability because we are valuing asset and liability. So if there is no principal market or you don't have access to it, you would look at the advantageous market. What is the advantageous market? If you want to sell this asset, how much the maximum you can get for it in this advantageous market? If it's a liability, What's the least amount you can get rid of this asset, of this liability, if it's a liability? Now, bear in mind, for advantageous market, you do consider the transaction cost because you are looking for a specific market. You take transaction costs into account, and don't worry, we would look an example with numbers later on sh showing you this effect. Now, we talked about access to market. Again, I'm going to I'm going to explain this. It's important to note that an entity must have access to the market. You have access to it. You have a key. You can enter this market and buy and sell. If you can't, how good is it for you? It's not relevant. So this is the assumption. Just because a market exists, it doesn't mean it applies to you if you don't have access to it. So let's assume something is selling for $100, but you, you don't access this market. Well, it's not $100 for you. You have to go to some other market. Valuing financial assets and non-financial assets. So we have to understand we have financial assets and non-financial assets. In this session, I mostly discuss financial assets. I will have a specific session about non-financial asset, but I want you to know that the way you value financial versus non-financial, it makes a difference. So fair value accounting applies to both financial and non-financial asset. Financial asset, we're talking about stocks, bonds, representing transaction involving involving borrowing or lending money when we talk with, when we talk about bonds. When we talk about non-financial assets, what do you think that is? That's property, plant, equipment, land. When valuing 
land and property, plant and equipment, the concept of the highest and best use comes into play. So we don't look at a principal market, advantageous market. We're going to look at something else. Again, this will be a separate recording. Highest and best use comes into play and we'll define this. It involves determining the value of an asset based on its potential use in the market. This is for what? For non-financial assets, which we'll talk about in a separate recording. But I want you to know the way you find the fair market value for financial and non-financial, two different things. The hierarchy of the fair value, there's a hierarchy to ensure consistency and reliability. It provides a gap, a gap hierarchy. The hierarchy distinguish between assets and liabilities that trade on an active exchange and those that do not. And there are three levels of value estimates. We have level one, level two, and level three. Obviously, three level. We have three levels. So we need to define what is level one, what is level two, and what's level three. Starting with level one. Level one is also kind of think of the market approach, and you're going to see why. In level one, you estimate the value of the, you, you find the value, estimate the price, the fair market value of an item use, using quoted prices from active market for identical asset or liability, making them the most reliable and preferred approach. What does that mean? It means if you have an asset and that asset has an active market, active market means what? It means people are buying and selling the stocks, the bonds at a certain price, at a quoted price, at the, at the market value. Well, guess what? If you're using level one, that's the most reliable it's an observable price, directly observable price. They are considered the most reliable and transparent valuation. So if you have an asset, again, what are we talking about here? Stocks and bonds, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Walmart. Those are stocks and they have an active market with quoted price. You would know exactly how much the stock price is traded at today. That's the most reliable. Well, what happened if that's not the case? Then we go to level two. Level two estimate rely on observable inputs other than quoted price. What does that mean? Observable input from less active market. So what's the difference between those? So what's the difference between level one and level two? Level one, I have a quoted price for the same asset. Notice it's identical asset, identical asset or identical liability. If I have an Apple stock, if I carry the stock or someone else in California have the Apple stock, it's the identical stock. When I am carrying an asset and there's no identical asset to it, what are we talking about here? Let's assume I own some sort of um, an asset, a stock that's privately traded, okay? And there's no quoted price for it. What can I do? I can look at companies of different si of, of similar size, similar risk to that to that asset. There are inputs other than quoted prices, including within level one that are observable for the asset liability, either directly or indirectly. What, what do they include? This include? This include quoted prices for similar assets and liabilities in active markets. I'll give you an example. For example, if we take a company called Wawa. Wawa is a, it's a gas station, it's a, a, it's a convenience store. Wawa is privately traded. So there's no quoted price for Wawa. But what I can do is I can look at similar companies that are publicly traded to Wawa and say, well, if they're worth that much, Wawa must be worth that much. So quoted prices for identical or similar asset or liabilities in markets that are not active. Okay, input other than quoted prices that are observable for the asset or the liability. Or we could look at the effect of interest rate, the volatility, and other factors to determine the price. They are used. You would use these, all these factors when we don't have level one input. We don't have quoted price. To make it easier for you to understand, think about if you have a building, although we're talking about maybe financial asset. Let's assume you have a building in Philadelphia, okay? And you want to find out the fair market value of that building. There's no active price. You don't have an identical, identical building to that building. So what you do is you would look in Philadelphia for similar building, same size in the same area, same features that, that's, that's sold recently and say, well, if this other building was sold at 5 million, practically my building is practically the same in the same geographical area. It has the same uh, square footage, uh, the same profile. Therefore, my building should be worth 5 million. It's not because someone is buying and selling this building at 5 million, but someone similar to me is selling the building at 5 million. This will be level two. 
How about level three? Level three, we're using cash flow here. Level three estimates involve the use of unobservable input. We can see the input require the application of a valuation model and management estimates or expected future value. Simply put, we're, simply put, level three is we're looking at input that the company decide. Usually it's cash flow. You could use income as well, but cash flow is the most accurate. This level might be used when there's no market activity for the asset or the liability at the measurement date. Obviously, if there's a market, I would use level one. If there is if there is no quoted market, if there's similar asset, I would use level two. But here, I don't have anything. Example would include private equity investments, complex derivatives, real estate asset, and unliquid market, where there's no similar asset to that. It's an unliquid market. Since level three input are based on unobservable data, they are considered to be least reliable and involve the most judgment. So if the asset don't have quoted price level one, it doesn't have a similar asset, then what do I rely on? I rely on input. Sometimes this is called, called the cost, like how much it will cost in terms of cash flow. So what you do is you, for example, you would look at, at a real estate asset. You would say, okay, there's no similar item to it. There is no quoted price. What am I going to do? I'm going to look at this asset and determine how much it's it's going to be generating in cash flow, 1 million, 1 million, 1 million a year. And I'm going to discount the cash flow to find the fair value. So I will discount the cash flow. Here, the management, management is using estimate and discretion. And this is where problem could occur under level three, because under level three, you are making subjective judgment. And once we discuss the disclosure about fair value, we're going to see that level three need the most disclosure because you need to tell the users about how did you determine level three. You have to give them as much details as possible so they can be comfortable in determining what does level three entails because level three is a subjective. If you don't tell them, well, this is what Enron used to do, arbitrarily assign fair market value to their asset, booking profit, out of fictitious just by saying it's worth this much. Well, explain to me why it's worth this much. This is what level three is saying because there's no direct quote for level one. There's no observable similar data. You're using discounted cash flow. Tell me about all your assumptions and we'll see what these assumptions are when we talk about the, uh, the disclosure that's needed for this. Let's take a look at this multiple choice question from Farhat Lectures to help us understand how do we determine the fair value. Adam Company wants to determine the fair value of a derivative instrument. Okay. While the exact instrument is not traded frequently, there are similar instruments, there are similar derivatives with observable market data. Which level of the fair value hierarchy should Adam consider for this valuation? Are we looking at valuation one, valuation two, valuation three, valuation four? What can you do immediately on the CPA exam? Well, there's no level four. That's out. Well, there's no there's no an active market because it says here it's not traded frequently. Level one is out. So we are between level two and level three. We're down to 50-50 immediately. So if, between level two and level three, what do you think? Is it level two or is it level three? Well, what is level two? Level two, you are looking at similar derivative instruments. If there are simil similar derivatives instruments to this instrument that we have, to this asset, then we would look at this. Although it's not an active market, but it's it's similar. Level three is when we don't have a similar derivative instrument, we're looking at some other factor, maybe the discounted cash flow. Then we will make our assumption based on that. What are we told here? We are told while the exact instrument is not traded frequently, so one is out, there are similar derivatives with observable market data. We have similar instrument with observable market data, similar to that, and we have the data for that. Well, I would assume those similar instruments are fair market value to my instrument. Therefore, I'm going to go with level two. Therefore, the answer is level two. What should you do? You should go to Farhat Lectures and look at additional MCQs. That's going to help you understand level one, level two, level three. The next thing we're going to discuss is disclosure and reconciliation because fair market value is important. Invest in yourself. If you're studying for your CPA exam or your any certification or an accounting student, don't shortchange yourself. Accounting is important. A CPA is worth it. It's a 20, 30 year investment in yourself. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe.